Hello everyone, I am Dr. Simone Atkinson from Get to the Point Nursing Notes. In today's lesson, we will discuss spinal cord injury. So as usual, let's get to the point. Spinal cord injuries are usually caused by trauma and young adults and adolescents are most often at risk. And spinal cord injury is a disruption of the nerve tracts and that is caused by cord transection, partial transection, contusion, compression, or lacerations. Now the injury leads to a loss of sensory and motor function at the level of the injury and below. An excessive force that's applied to the spinal cord and the vertebral column usually result in four different types of injuries. First is hyperflexion that compresses the vertebral bodies and disrupts ligaments and discs. Then there is hyperextension that disrupts ligaments and cause vertebral fractures. Another condition is axial loading, which is an excessive application of a vertical force that may cause compression fractures. And then fourth, excessive rotation, tears, ligaments, and fractures, articular surfaces, and causes compression fractures. Now what this means is that when the spine experiences excessive rotation, the vertebrae are twisting beyond their normal range of motion. So the ligaments that are tough bands of connective tissue holding the vertebrae together, they tear and become damaged, leading to an instability in the spinal column. Now the articular surfaces where the two vertebrae come together, they experience significant stress on the surfaces and result in fractures or damage to the bony structures of the vertebra. And then the vertebra can then, will then collapse or are compressed causing the fractures. Now spinal cord injuries are classified as either complete or incomplete by the cause of injury and by the level of injury. Cervical injury occurs above C4 and interferes with respiration and paralysis of all the extremities and involvement at C5 to C8 allows some shoulder movement. However, the client still experiences a decrease in the respiratory reserve. So depending on the level, thoracic injury may involve loss of sensation and movement of the chest, trunk, bladder, bowel, and legs. Lumbar and sacral injury may result in loss of sensation and movement to the legs and may cause neurogenic bladder and interfere with erection and ejaculation in men. In spinal cord injuries, the most frequently involved vertebrae are the C5 to C7, T12, and L1. Nursing assessment depends on the level of injury which is defined as the lowest area of spinal cord that has intact sensory and motor function. The nurse should assess the client's respiratory rate, depth, and pattern, as well as sensory and motor function. Paraplegia is paralysis of the lower body and occurs when the injury is in the thoracic spine or lower. Tetraplegia, formerly known as quadriplegia, is paralysis of the arms, trunk, legs, and pelvic portions of the body. Tetraplegia occurs when the level of injury is in the cervical spine. Now, spinal shock is a temporary loss of reflex function, and the symptoms include bradycardia, hypotension, flaccid paralysis of skeletal muscles, loss of pain, touch, temperature, pressure, visceral and somatic sensations, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and loss of ability to perspire. Spinal shock is considered to be resolved once the spinal reflexes return. The nurse must assess for autonomic hyperreflexia in patients with spinal cord injury. Now this is an exaggerated sympathetic nervous system response that occurs with injuries at level T6 or higher but it is only seen after the client recovers from spinal shock. Autonomic hyperreflexia occurs when the stimuli cannot ascend the spinal cord. A noxious stimulus triggers massive vasoconstriction below the level of the injury, vasodilation above the injury, 
bradycardia and rapid onset of systolic hypertension with a widening pulse pressure. The nurse's priority is to identify the cause of the autonomic hyperreflexia and correct the cause by removing the stimulus. To address autonomic hyperreflexia, the nurse promptly elevates the head of the bed and removes any anti-embolism stockings or sequential compression devices. Blood pressure monitoring should occur every two to three minutes while also identifying and assessing stimuli that triggered the autonomic hyperreflexive response. Once the stimulus is identified, it should be immediately removed. Various stimuli, such as distended bladder, stool in the rectum, or mechanical or thermal stimuli affecting the skin can provoke autonomic hyperreflexia. Now, if severe hypertension persists, despite removing the offending stimulus, the healthcare provider must be notified immediately. Antihypertensive medications should be administered as per the established protocol. Diagnostic and laboratory tests include x-rays to visualize fractures, CT and MRI scans to show changes in the vertebrae, spinal cord, and tissues surrounding the spinal cord. An EMG may be done after the acute injury phase to locate the level of injury. Now there are six incomplete spinal cord injury syndromes. The first one is central cord syndrome, characterized by a more pronounced loss of motor function in the upper extremities with varying patterns of intact sensation remaining. Anterior cord syndrome, allows sensations of touch, position, and vibrations to remain intact below the level of the injury. However, motor function, pain, and temperature sensation are lost. In posterior cord injury, motor function remains intact, but there is a loss of position, vibration, and crude touch sensations. brown saccard syndrome results in a loss of motor function, vibration, proprioception, and deep touch sensations. These sensations are lost on the same side as the spinal cord damage. Conus medullary syndrome involves flaccid lower extremities and bladder and bowel areflexia. While micturition or voiding may remain intact, there is a loss of ability for penile erection if the damage is in the upper sacral segments of the spinal cord. Cauda echina syndrome involves a reflexia of the bowel, bladder, and lower body reflexes. The acute management of patients with spinal cord injury involves several crucial steps to prevent further damage and stabilize the client. The nurse's primary responsibility is to maintain a patent airway by assessing and ensuring unobstructed breathing. To immobilize the injury effectively, the nurse should keep the client's head immobilized without flexion, extension, or rotation. And if necessary, manual traction on the head can be applied by placing hands on the head near the ears. When moving the client, a log roll technique should be used. Avoid any twisting or turning of the spine. Additionally, the head of the bed should be kept flat to maintain spinal extension. Stabilization of the injury may require the use of specific devices such as Gardner-Wells tongs, halo traction, or surgical intervention. It just depends on the indication. Now complications related to respiratory distress should be promptly addressed, ranging from oxygen therapy to intubation and mechanical ventilation as needed. For a tonic bladder, inserting of an indwelling urinary catheter can be performed and to prevent a paralytic ileus, an appropriate bowel regimen should be initiated. Now, if cardiovascular instability arises, vasoactive drugs may be administered. The nurse's priority remains closely monitoring the patient's vital capacity and respiratory effectiveness, particularly in cases of high cervical injuries such as C4 or above, or lower injuries where edema might ascend the cord and potentially inhibit respirations, which would necessitate mechanical ventilation. And additionally, ascending edema should be watched for and it can also lead to respiratory compromise. So to assist the client with quad coughing, 
the nurse should apply pressure in and up at the xiphoid process during coughing to aid in clearing the airways. Now a bowel and bladder program can be instituted to establish a regular schedule for bowel elimination, which will prevent that paralytic ileus and urinary retention. Lastly, as we mentioned, autonomic hyperreflexia must be treated immediately to prevent any serious complications and in summary, acute management of spinal cord injury involves the proper immobilization, airway maintenance, stabilization, close respiratory monitoring, and addressing potential complications with appropriate interventions. The nurse will deliver continuous care to the client with Gardner-Wells tongs by implementing principles of skeletal traction. And these tongs or halo traction might be in place due to fractures or dislocated cervical vertebrae. The nurse should encourage the client to express their feelings and cope with the loss of function and care and assist in the client with techniques and adaptive devices recommended by the physical therapy team will help promote increased independence in daily activities. Items such as slide boards and wheelchairs, utensils with built up handles or other tools suggested by the rehabilitation team may be used by the clients. Now encouraging the client to engage in self-care, making decisions independently and involve the family and important decision makers in discussions are vital aspects of the care plan. Medication therapy may include corticosteroids like methylprednisolone to reduce spinal cord edema and vasoactive drugs can be administered to manage hypotension resulting from spinal shock or antihypertensives can be used to manage hypertension from autonomic hyperreflexia. To treat spasticity, antispasmodics like baclofen may be prescribed and analgesics and tricyclic antidepressants can help manage pain. So as a nurse, your ongoing role is to educate and support the client and their family to promote independence and self-care. So encourage clients to engage in activities like self-catheterization techniques, bowel evacuation, and daily living tasks. Inform the client and their family about various community resources available as needed to aid in their care and the rehabilitation process. For the clients with a halo vest, teach them that the vest is used to raise the center of gravity and to avoid bending over in order to reduce the risk of falls. Emphasize the importance of keeping their neck immobilized in a midline position and guide them to turn their entire body to scan their environment effectively. Now regarding diet, recommend eating soft foods and cutting foods into small pieces. Using a straw for liquids can also be beneficial and remind clients not to drive until they are cleared to do so by their physician. All right, so now you are armed and better prepared to care for clients with spinal cord injuries. If you found this helpful, please show your support by giving the video a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel and sharing it with others. Stay tuned for the next video.